Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, Katie Sutton should be joining any moment. Um, she is a co-principal with me at Randolph Union High School. Um, I am one of two co-principals there. And Lane Millington, our superintendent, just joined us as well. Um, our focus originally for this community forum was on volunteerism. We've had um, some families reach out to us about um, We've had some families reach out to us about wanting to um, volunteer at the school or help out with some projects. We had a really positive prom planning meeting um, about a week ago, um, and we see the real benefit for our students when we're able to work together in that sort of capacity. Um, so we thought that hosting a forum focused on volunteerism would be a really positive thing to do. Um, so that is why we planned um, this event for this evening. And we're hopeful that we can maintain that focus, even though I know that people have other thoughts that they'd like to share this evening. Um, so our hope is to keep the conversation civil, keep it focused on um, communicating positively with each other and creating community for the benefit of our students. Um, and I'm not sure if Lane has anything by way of introduction that he would like to add, or if Katie has been able to jump on yet, um, but we'll go ahead and get started momentarily. Yeah, no, I'm happy to be here and talking with folks. It's actually, it's good to see folks showing out and, um, hopefully, you know, I can answer questions that are, are directly related to me. I can provide whatever insight that folks may be interested in. Uh, but again, the, the big thing tonight is that, you know, keep things respectful. Let's see what we can learn from each other as, as we have this discussion tonight. I think that's the most important thing always. So thank you. Um, and Katie Sutton has jumped on. Katie, I don't know if you'd like to introduce yourself. Um, and I just framed out um, what we were thinking when we originally planned this forum for tonight. I'm a little preoccupied as I have to approve people coming into the meeting. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Yeah, happy to introduce myself, Katie Sutton, co-principal at Randolph Union Middle and High School. Um, excited to have conversations with you all. Um, as Lisa noted, we are hoping to, to discuss opportunities to further collaborate with, with the community at RU um, and open to, to other topics. Right. Um, would anyone like to jump in? Um, I can share a little bit about the ideas that community members have brought to us um, so far this school year in terms of volunteerism. Um, we've had people bring up project graduation. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, that's um, an end of year celebration aimed at having students safely celebrate their graduation together. Um, so that's something we've been working with um, some, some families on. Um, prom, as I mentioned earlier, and we also had a parent talk earlier about volunteerism to help support um, recess, lunches, those sorts of things, um, just to give kids more positive adults connecting with them in their lives. Um, I see that David Amadon has raised his hand. So I'll turn yeah. it over to David Thanks. for a moment. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, and thanks to the administrative folks for being here and, and hosting. So I, I know that there was an email that went out and it talked about Chick-fil-A and some specifics about that. And I certainly am no fan of Chick-fil-A based on their targeting Vermont small business owners uh, through through, you know, over aggressive corporate copyright infringement laws. Um, but I, I want to just put something out there that is something that is, I've been thinking about for years and have yet to bring up. Um, and that is just the total amount of advertising that our students are exposed to at school. I graduated high school in 1993. When I was in high school, it was a big debate to bring channel one TV services into the school. The company provided the school with TVs, a closed circuit televisions, all this stuff, and the students were exposed to advertising during their school day. And that was something I fought as a student. Um, 
you know, Coke machines had the Coke logos taken out, even if they sold Coke. So, you know, I don't have anything more specific to say about any specific controversies or topics or whatever, but I, for one, would love to see us using technological solutions to reduce overall advertising that the students are exposed to at school. And I'll just step out one step further and say, speaking as a parent, I feel that way. Uh, speaking as a substitute teacher, I've heard students express the desire to not have all the ads, um, even when they're viewing, say, a legitimate educational video on YouTube. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. I don't know if it needs to be discussed, but it, like I said, it's something that's been on my mind for ne a number of years. It's never felt like a huge priority, but this seemed like as good a time as any to bring it up. So thank you for letting me share that. Thank you. Kristen Chandler. Oh, thanks, Lisa. I just wanted, when you mentioned the prom thing, I just wanted to say, like, I had never been involved with that. I didn't know it was a thing. It wasn't with my older child. But I thought it was a great example of parents getting involved, you know, not not being, you know, not trying to take over, you know, your and Katie's role and, and Kara's role as the senior advisor. But it was really nice to see a good mix of people come and really uh, help plan that event and continue to help plan it. So I really appreciated that opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you. Yeah, go I just for it. The, to add to what you said, Kristen, and I really appreciated that opportunity too. It was actually a lot of fun <laughs> to get together with all of you for such a joyful occasion, um, to think of doing something special for our kids and I really appreciated all the ideas you all brought to the table. And, you know, we, we could have planned it as we normally did, but I thought that this collaboration is exactly what Lisa and I are hoping for in terms of collaboration with the community to serve our kids. So, so appreciate that you came and that everyone else came and that we're continuing this collaboration. It's such a positive, bright spot, honestly. Yeah, um, Jessica Allen. Yeah, so um, the Chick-fil-A is the hot topic, but I think the hot topic is more than just Chick-fil-A. It's about the inconsistencies of the school and where our parents are allowed. Um, you know, coming from a standpoint of supporting boosters at one point this year, it was like we had all these things planned and then we weren't allowed to have a bonfire at winter because we were told coaches didn't want it, which didn't stem to be. These kids in seventh grade should be coming into that school and looking forward to something every year. Um, tenth grade, ninth grade should be a trip. Tenth grade should be class ring. Eleventh grade should be something. If you're not going to do your as a junior prom, twelfth grade should be a senior trip. Why are kids not starting from day one fundraising for their twelfth grade year? Why are we not able to work as a community and hear people's thoughts and opinions? and respect them and move forward for these kids. Thank you, Jessica. Um, it, it has been several years since that sort of structure has been in place and Katie and I have been working on reinstating student leadership. Um, we have middle school student council this year, um, high school student leadership. And so we are starting to make, I think, positive strides in that direction. Um, it's still been a really challenging year in terms of beginning the year with under COVID restrictions. Um, but I, I, we are open to hearing ideas and working um, along those lines. And we, we did actually have coaches that did say, you know, they didn't want students out the night before a game or a meet. Um, so that was what I heard directly from a coach um, related to the winter bonfire. So I, I think that I was told that was all coaches. And I think there's probably some coaches on here tonight that maybe could speak if to that. Yeah. Um, but it continues to be, we plan things, we try to support the school, and then we get this pushback. Um, it's just, it's frustrating as a parent to be able to provide, these should be the best days of my life. Yeah, I have a kid who left this semester, begs not to come back to RU. I have a kid who can't wait to be out of there next year. 
I have an eighth grader saying, please don't send me there in ninth grade. Uh, my kid takes a poop in the school because there's no doors. Everybody comes in and they have a big party in the bathroom because uh, there's no privacy. I mean, our kids don't love that school. They are vandalizing the school. Mm -hmm. We have to figure out a way to make this a safe, fun, and exciting place and incentives to be there. That is what we need to figure out tonight. Instead of being a think tank, we need action steps. Thank you, Jessica. Other thoughts? I don't know, Katie, if you um, want to share a little bit about what Sam's PBL has been doing this year. I feel like that might be an opportunity for us to share a little bit about what our students have been doing to give back. Um, sure. Um, I can say what they're what they're working on right now is um, they're working on the, the community garden. Um, there's a community member who um, who usually takes care of the garden, who needs help. Um, and so actually our National Honor Society students and our students from Interact will be helping um, to maintain that garden with the potential to maintain it over the summer as well. Um, so some extended, extended summer learning opportunities there, hopefully. Um, I also can speak a little bit to what Lisa was mentioning about our attempt um, to, you know, have a, a renaissance of student leadership. Um, we both have our own student leadership groups. Uh, Lisa works with the middle level and I work with the high school level. Um, we have subcommittees that are developed um, on the basis of student interest. So we have a curriculum uh, committee, we have an events committee, um, and we have um, a, a few different committees that are looking at discipline and policy. Um, and again, this is, this is an opportunity for students to be a part of different interests that they have in, get, in participating in the school and having agency in making decisions and informing a lot of our decisions, um, you know, at the, the school building level. So um, that's been a real joy. I think for both of us, we can say that, um, you know, meeting with these different groups on a weekly basis and, and really getting student income input into um, what it is we're, we're determining um, and, and even into what's being offered in our course catalog um, and some of the decisions we're making about what we offer students on an annual basis um, as voice and choice in the school. So it's, it's been really exciting and we hope to build on that. And I understand um, your frustration, Jessica, and, and we share it. We, we definitely have not been able to do a lot of what we've wanted to do in the past two years for sure. And this year, has been a learning year for us in being back in the building all together and addressing the you know various needs that we're seeing for our students and, and staff. Kristen? Well, I just, just to follow up on that, I think it's gonna be some acknowledgement that the staff um, are, are exhausted, you know, from dealing with COVID and dealing with all these, uh, you know, trying to think outside the box and how to deliver services and everything that they've been doing. Well, um, I don't have, I mean, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with throwing out ideas. You know, I just, I think to expect, um, uh, I think what Jessica, what you said was action steps at, at this juncture, I think it's, it's a tough, it's a tough ask. Um, certainly, you know, I hope people can recover and rest and rejuvenate over the summer and start seeing things differently in the fall. Um, the one other thing I just wanted to say was um, there was some, you know, whenever there's controversy, it, it feels like, you know, suddenly the community is divided and, and Lane has to weigh in. And, and I got to say, this latest controversy, Lane didn't weigh in until yesterday. 
Um, and that really hurt uh, because he is a leader. He's supposed to be, you know, the face of the school and, and um, you know, sort of giving us some direction. And it was so um, ironic, I think, that on, on Saturday in the, in the uh, Vermont Digger, there was an article about divisiveness up at Burlington High School and some real controversy up there. And there was a quote from the superintendent there that was just like so lovely that uh, embraced the whole community and said something about just wanting to have an environment where everybody felt they belonged. And it was just a really nice thing. And I just, I just think, um, I think that that Lane is, uh, I, I don't know if you don't recognize what an important figure and voice you have, I, I think you do, but I think it's really critical that you um, explain some, some actions to the public when you've, ha when you've done them so that everybody can learn from them and everybody can understand. And I, I don't think it's gonna, um, you know, fuel the fire necessarily. And in fact, I think you've made some some decisions in the past and then you've, you've explained them to the public and it's sort of calmed the waters, you know? So I, I just, that would be my wish going forward is that um, you just, you know, wouldn't be, if, I don't know why you didn't come out sooner, you know, to say something. Um, if you thought it would, you know, further the, you know, sometimes I, I totally agree that if more people comment about something it just kind of snowballs. But I think in your unique position, I think it was important to say something and to say it sooner. Yeah, I have a, I, I actually, I appreciate the, the thought because you and I think a lot alike exactly in what you're saying. Um, I did address the issue when it first came up. Um, I was in the hospital. Um, it's been a long year um, for all of us, a long couple of years. Um, and so one of the reasons that I wasn't as active on the weekends and whatnot as, as I normally am is because I was in the hospital, um, just so folks know. So it wasn't, wasn't an oversight. It, it was the, the, the flesh just wasn't willing um, at that point in time. So I do apologize for that. No, uh, no apology necessary. I'm, I'm sorry that happened to you. So thanks for explaining that. Thank you. Um, other thoughts this evening? I'm, I'm, if you see me looking off to the side, I'm keeping a list of what people are sharing. Um, Dana Decker. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm here on behalf of Racial Justice and NHS to announce... Wait, do we have to stay on this topic, Lisa, Katie, or could I do what I wanted to do and um, to announce that we're having an event on May 7th um, for Ukrainian awareness at the rec center from 11 to four. And we're going to have music and art projects and um, a potluck. So I just wanted to invite everybody and know that you could reach out to any of the students that are in the RJ class or in the NHS and ask them about it and um, the more the merrier and any volunteers please reach out to either Kelly Tucker or myself and thank you. Thank you Dana. There other thoughts on um, ways to connect with our students with the community or for community members to um, push in and volunteer? Or surface um, some challenges that you think we could um, put more attention or pay more attention to um, and work with volunteers on? David White. Hi, Lisa. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the need is for, for all of those things that have, they've asked, but uh, I remember project graduation when I was a senior and it was a really positive experience. So I'll volunteer that night if you need another supervisor or whatever, I'm willing to help out. Thank you. I think we're just in the very early planning stages. Katie could speak more to that. Um, since I work more with the younger kids who have a few years before they get there. 
Yeah, I've been talking to a community member about Project Graduation. Um, we started the conversation, I would say, you know, uh, about a month ago. Um, and she said the same thing. She said, you know, I remember Project Graduation. It was a lot of fun. Um, she recollects it from a, from a different um, school in another state. Um, but I think, you know, many of us probably enjoyed an opportunity to um, to have project graduation. So we are in the beginning stages of thinking about it, and I'm not quite sure that we'll roll it out this year. We, we really want to think about it, you know, in a thorough way and make sure that we really have the resources and, and capacity to do it well. Um, but I'm, I'm really open to that conversation too. And, and if there is a lot of community interest in, in getting it off the ground this year, I'm, I, I'm, absolutely open to hearing your thoughts and to hosting an opportunity for a committee to form and for us to focus our attention on it. So definitely have the intention to, to, to put that together. Right. Are there other um, questions or thoughts that people might want to share? Jeremy Rilling. Hey there, uh, Coach. Coach Rilling, everybody, <laughs> hear me? Okay. <laughs> oh no, my my dog is responding. So yeah, I'm my, my <laughs> <laughs> gonna get loud. I just want to uh, go back to to what Jessica said for a minute and. As a head of a program, the basketball program at the school, uh, I know back to the, the winter bonfire that I was never asked the question as to whether we wanted to do that or not. Uh, all the coaches that I have spoken to uh, were not asked as well. Um, and I know you said that one coach responded that they didn't want to. I just want to make sure that that's out there, that <clears throat> that question was never asked of me um, and, and what the team wanted to do. Uh, I also want to just quickly mention that <clears throat> Jessica said, you know, a lot of kids are looking to bail out of school. I don't know if you have any data on uh, the number of requests for school choice and also <clears> – <throat> There's also rumors going around that even members of our own school board are sending their kids to other schools. And I think that's a really interesting topic that should be discussed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do have data on the number of students requesting school choice. Um, I was just looking, I can't pull that spreadsheet up immediately. Um, I think I have it, I'm looking for it right now. Okay. I'm, I'm looking to Lisa. Thank you, Kara. We've had a non-COVID cold going around school and other health issues that people have been facing. So um, if some of us sound a little raspy, it's, it's happening. Yeah, so we have been digging into um, some of that data Jeremy, typically we have more students coming in than we have um, going out, um, but it has been a challenging time, I think, in schools across our state, not only in Randolph. Um, it, it's just been a really challenging year in a lot of ways. Kara has raised her hand. Sorry, I have voice nodules. I'm not sick. I just can't talk. Um, so it's Two come, two who've requested to come in, and six going who have, who have done stuff to go out, but not all of them were accepted. Thank you, Kara, for that information. Um, and I think that you know, speaking about what Jessica said about the bathrooms, that is an an ongoing challenge. Um, we do normally have about seven bathrooms open with doors on stalls. Um, and we have single stall bathrooms throughout the school that are, are open 
it's for students. Um, but early this school year, there was a TikTok challenge related to vandalizing bathrooms and that vandalism has continued throughout the school year. Um, it's just been something that's been incredibly frustrating for all parties involved, especially for our facilities staff who have worked tirelessly really throughout this pandemic to make sure that the schools were clean and sanitized. And then to have breakage on top of that has just been incredibly challenging for everybody. And it's incredibly challenging to um, determine who exactly is responsible. Nathan? Yes, good evening. Uh, Nathan Wright uh, graduated 1995 with David White and Jeremy Rilling. Um, along the topics of what Jeremy and, and, and Jessica said, um, I've had a son that's gone through this high school, and I have a son that's coming into seventh grade next year. And my wife and I have some major concerns um, with some of the policies and some of the things that are going on in the middle school and high school. And one of those things is the bathroom issue. Um, I'm just curious, you know, if the vandalism is still going on and it's not comfortable for students to use the bathrooms, what, what are the police finding in the investigation? And for these children or students that are vandalizing, you know, what are we doing to, you know, prevent that and to make it safe for the students to use the bathroom when needs so? Uh, the other thing I think, uh, just looking at my list here that I made talking to other parents in the communities, and I had this frustration with my oldest, is, you know, we try to get involved with our students' education. And one of that thing is to keep up with their grades. And what we're finding is it's very challenging for staff to keep the grades updated on the mobile app. I don't know what you guys are using now, but I know it was a challenge for four years with my son, Logan, for us to keep on top of what work needs to be done. And I know that they have a certain, um, expectations of responsibility that they need to do on their own but for us to be involved in, in their success it's nice to have those um, updated regularly so we can question it so we can call the you know the teachers call a meeting with the student uh, or our children and and come up with a solution and i know we're all very exhausted with COVID. it seems like an ongoing thing um and i, and I applaud all the staff and teachers that keep plugging away just Keep in mind too, for, for us parents, we had to sacrifice some careers uh, so we could stay home with our kids too. And we're, and we're all very exhausted, but you know, as of now between, you know, the drug dealing that's going on in the school and some of these bathrooms that get locked, um, single stall, the random hookups and sexual activity in these bathrooms, um, the cell phone usage in the school is a big issue for me. I saw a downfall of my oldest son being exposed to content on other kids' phones when they're supposed to be learning that we had not been ready to expose him to, mostly pornography, um, videos that are inappropriate, uh, and even, even even music choices in the 7th and 8th grade level. Um, I really feel as a community in the school, we need to really focus on what content is being brought in. And even though they're not on the school Wi-Fi, they still have um, access to it on school time and can expose um, other students to it. And, and quite frankly, um, I'm, I'm very concerned uh, to the point where I'm not really comfortable sending my kids to school in seventh grade next year, um, based on what he's gonna be exposed to back, you know, based on the lack of action of the vandalism that's going on, um, it, it's very concerning. Um, thank you. I, I'd like to say we we have taken action related to the vandalism. Sometimes the vandalism happens again, so facilities will fix it, um, and then something else occurs. It it is a frustration. Um, I I would appreciate an email or um, some direct communication if you have information about drug sales at school or any of those sorts of things. Um, we do have a persistent problem with vape. I think it's a problem that exists in our communities and in many schools. Um, and I'm not naive to the fact that other things can happen at schools. Um, it's just that vape has been our most persistent challenge so far this school year. 
Um, but I appreciate the concerns that you're raising and I'd love to have a conversation um, that's a little more detailed um, that's not in a public forum. Thank you. Um, Kate, can we have you yet? Um, so if you would like to share and then Jeremy, I see that your hand is raised again. I just wanted to, um, of course, my kids are a senior and a junior, and we didn't give them phones until they were in eighth and ninth grade. And I know times change very quickly. And when they were in eighth grade, it's different from society-wise society compared to eighth graders now. But I think we as parents bear some responsibility about children, our children, and the exposure of what they are seeing on, on TikTok or whatever else is out there. Yes, there is some responsibility in the school, but when I've been in the halls and such, I see a lot of teachers saying, put your phone away or explaining why their students have phones out. Um, they're doing a project and they need to look something up, but they're being monitored or whatever it might be. But I think as parents, we bear some serious responsibility as to what content our children are bringing into the schools and when I say that I'm relating to the bathrooms, I'm relating to um, what other kind of bullying may be going on, what other kind of programs they may be using. I don't know, because I'm not an eighth grade student, I'm not an eighth grader, but uh, I know I have a responsibility to make sure that my children are not exposing others or getting exposed to things they shouldn't be. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Jeremy? Uh, just just real quick, I just wanted to touch base. Uh, I know we were talking about facilities and, and such. And as a, a varsity basketball coach, you know, we get to visit whatever, 10, 11 schools a year. And I, I will say that our, our staff does a, a great job. Some of the some of the uh, locker rooms and such that we that we go into are are, are not always the nicest uh, and, and uh, clean. And and again, I just wanted to add that our our staff does a, a good job there. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Hi. Um. So, you know, I've been a teacher, a special educator, and a teacher at the high school for eleven years. I'm at RTCC now. I have two kids at RES. And I, I come to these community meetings because I care and I love these kids, but at what point do we start talking about how the issues that are happening in school is a community problem too? Um, the lack of social resources and the lack of mental health resources in our community is not helping. And there's only so much we can do as teachers at the school. There, you know, I know that myself and my colleagues, I can't think of one teacher that works at RTCC or RUHS that does not care deeply for these kids. And, and we are trying, but sometimes the trauma that has happened to these kids, especially over the past two years, especially growing up, and the lack of support that some of our students have, it makes for a very hard school day. And so I know that our students come to school to depend and they depend on us and it's a safe place for them. And we're trying to make it a safe environment for them, but we do not have, it's really hard to catch people while they're vaping. Some people don't smell it. It's it happens in all sorts of places. You can't have cameras in the bathroom. It's really hard to um, help students that can't access their education at the time and find a place for them so we could talk things out so that other people don't see the trouble that they're going through. And I, I'm now I'm rambling, but like, I think it's important for the community to know that this is a community problem too. And we have to take it as a whole village and, and figure out what is going on and how we could get to the bottom of it and how we could get more resources in the community in order to help. And I think that's my bottom line. Thank you, Dana. Kristen, and then Kara. Um, a couple things. One is um, a while ago, I, I, I want to say it was pre-COVID, um, 
we teamed up, the high school teamed up with Gifford and brought in some people who were experts in the field of vaping and had some really great discussions about that. And I was part of some other, I don't know if it was this community forum or something else where it was like me and one other parent who showed up and there were some folks from Gifford and that was, it was, feels like that was like maybe five, four or five months ago. And I, it is a community problem, Dana, and we have this great resource right here in the community, which is Gifford. Uh, and they have some experts in the field. And I, from, from um, my work, I just know that the peer to peer thing is what I think is really going to help. And kids aren't going to listen. They're not going to listen to the parents. They're not going to listen to adults. They're going to listen to each other about the dangers of vaping once you know, and, and there's a way to, there's a, there's a couple different programs where kids can become educators of their peers. So there's that. The other thing, Dana, is I don't know if you're aware, but um, a year ago, we had a community event where we, uh, around mental health, and we showed a f short film and had a discussion. And as a result of that here in Randolph, there's a monthly group of people that gets together, including Steph Leonard, the nurse from RTCC, um, Sadie has uh, signed up, but she's never been able to come, but uh, there's different community folks who just want to talk about what mental health resources are available in our community, and it's, there's a lot of focus right now on the school, and we've talked a lot about mental health first aid as a uh, free offering for staff, for coaches, um, for administration and the program that is also a peer-to-peer -peer thing uh, for um, uh, high school for high school juniors and seniors to get trained in mental health first aid, so they can be the the peer support for their uh, colleague, their friends. Given the high rate of suicide among adolescents in Vermont, you know we're we're way too high. Uh, I think we're fourth in the country as far as our statistics on adolescent suicide. So. Um, somebody mentioned that it would have to happen at an in-service day or something, but it has to be a priority of the administration to, to like actually have mental health first aid be a thing that's an eight hour class that everybody could take. And I will just say one more time that when I was a coach, I was required to take CPR and concussion protocol. And I really think coaches ought to be required to take mental health first aid. They're, they're such a, um, sometimes the only positive adult for kids. Um, they have, can have such an influence over kids. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a great resource that we have right here that's available for free. And it is, it is time consuming. It's a whole day, it's an eight hour program, but uh, it's invaluable when you think about our students' health. Thank you, Kristen, for that reminder about mental health first aid. I think I joined the initial showing of that film and then and then lost the thread, but I appreciate that reminder. Um, Kara, you raised your hand. Yeah, and I'm going to try to talk. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of student services, and um, I work with seventh and eighth graders as their school counselor, and then half of the 11th and 12th grade. I also oversee all of our um, student services support. So that includes a licensed social worker, a licensed mental health counselor, and two school counselors and an SAP. Um, additionally, I've done things like campus life, and I'm a cross-country coach. And I guess a couple of things that come to mind. One, Kristen, we, I have been in collaboration and talks with um, Claire Martin about getting us the first aid training. And my understanding is 10 of us, if 10 of us do it, then we can actually train ourselves after that. So we have been working to make that happen for 10 of us. Um, and we are trying to collaborate more and more from our end with Clara Martin. The other thing I just wanted to point out is like I I've been at Randolph for 15 years I care deeply for the community I don't happen to live in the community I have a seventh I have a daughter who is in sixth grade who will be going to Harwood next year based on where I live I the this is not a community problem either it's a state problem um Harwood has the same issues happening they have vaping happening in the bathroom. They like, it's not just us. However, 
it does take a village to think through what we're going to do to address the problem. And if it becomes blaming one group over another, over another, that's not problem solving. That's citing blame when there's, I don't think there's blame to be cited. I think it's just a, an issue right now of people are very dysregulated after two years of isolation. And how do we work together? How do we come together? How do we collaborate and show kids that we ourselves are ready to be self-regulated? Um, if I lived in Randolph, I would certainly feel comfortable sending my seventh grader to Randolph. In fact, she joined our middle school ski trip and was part of an eighth grade group and thought the kids were great. So I, it saddens me for us to think that it's something's wrong with our school, I think, or our community. I think it's, we need to expand our thinking to think through there's been a global pandemic and the aftermath of a global pandemic is going to be that mental health has suffered. And how do we think through that? So anyway, I appreciate all of you. I love the Randolph community. Um, I'm sorry that my voice is wonky. And if anyone has questions specific to mental health services at RU, certainly I'm the person to contact. I think the only other thing I would add, um, Kristen, to what you were saying about uh, Gifford is that we have started a partnership with Gifford and we have been working with them on cessation. And we actually just rolled out our high school group last week. Um, and we're going to offer a middle level group as well. Um, and through Gifford, um, we're also offering that as a resource for our students to you know, meet with the experts who work at Gifford as well so that they can also have um, direct services for cessation through Gifford um, also. Yeah, I, I don't know if she's willing to speak to it, but Katja Evans um, is on with us this evening and she has been an important part of that partnership with Colin Andresik. Um, so Katja, if you're able to, it would be great if you could share a little bit about the work that you and, and Colin have been doing. Um, sure, I'd be happy to answer some questions about that and give a little insight into that group. Um, so that arose out of recognizing that there is kind of a need for support for students in school and meeting kids where they are as well, rather than yeah, yeah. into outside resources. Um, so we have created a group. We actually are leading two groups now. We have started last week in school, a middle school time and a high school time. These are currently open sessions that students can participate in um, where they can come and either if they themselves are concerned about their habit, they can meet with us um, individually in a supportive and confidential environment to discuss that or if they have concerns about friends or family member usage we can talk to them about that as well. Um, so we are just really trying to help create, you know, av areas and avenues for kids to be able to explore this, understand, ask questions, um, and feel that they can come forward if they if they choose to. And on that note, we are still trying to work on expanding other supports that we can make possible for students that have been identified as wanting to quit and making sure that those supports are readily available and, and basically there when they make that decision um, to help them out. So we will continue to work on that. Um, and you know we'll be seeing kind of what's working in the school and for the students and staff and faculty um, and where we need to make improvements or changes or work that structure differently. So we have started that as well. Thank you, Katja. And it, it does feel really positive when we connect with students who share that they're working really hard on quitting and that they hadn't realized how addictive vape was. Um, and we are beginning to hear some of that. So that feels really hopeful to me. Amy Ferris, I see that your hand is up. Amy, would you like to share? Oh, sorry, I didn't have the mic. Um, so I have two um, thoughts slash questions, um, and I would agree with much of what I've already heard. Um, I have two graduates from Randolph and one, I'm a graduate myself and a sophomore. So my two concerns or thoughts, one is I'd like to see the tech center and the high school work together more. You know, having a student athlete 
having a child who's played sports for other schools because we didn't offer those sports. Um, I've seen a lot of schools, I've seen a lot of collaboration between schools, tech centers and their high schools, which definitely adds to the spirit of a school. Um, when you can get posters or um, flyers or technology to record ball games or what have you, um, it, I'd like to see the tech center and the high school work together more. I think that would do a lot for our students and I think that would do a lot for the school itself and the community really. Um, and if there's anything these last two years have taught us, it's that the tech center jobs are just as important as the four year degrees. So that's one thought. The other thought is, I would like to know for the end of this school year, we're, we've been talking about community and how community is important. Well, at least for some of the kids that I've talked with and for my own son, having the eighth grade passage ceremony and senior awards and high school graduation, and then expecting them to come back for three and a half student days is not really embracing community. And the kids, at least that I've spoken with and my son, are not excited that you're going to have these celebrations and then the kids have to come back for three and a half days and i'd like to know how those how the kids are going to come back and feel like they should come back how are those three and a half days going to be productive if they know that graduations already happened and the passage ceremonies already happened because in their minds school is over once those celebrations happen um, thank you for those questions. Um, I was taking notes and I wanted to note that Katie and I have begun meeting weekly with Felicia at the Tech Center. So we've been really working on tightening up that partnership because we agree that collaboration makes us all stronger. Um, so I appreciate you noting that and that is something that is in progress. Um, in terms of the end of the school year, we were hearing from RES that their graduation is being bumped to um, bumped a little bit later. And we're talking about the eighth grade passage ceremony as well. The eighth grade team, you know, agrees that we should move that to the next week now that we know when the final day of school will be. Um, so those are things that we're talking about. Um, we also have been talking about ways to make that final week of school feel productive and celebratory and like a fitting way to wrap up this school year. I think, you know, we can either look at that as something that's like drudgery and we have to drag ourselves through those last few days, or we can look at it as an opportunity. And I, I know that I at least, I'm choosing to view that as an opportunity. And again, I apologize about my vocal puppy in the background. Um, Katie, I don't know if you wanted to add to that. We have another parent with a hand raised. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add to it is, is as Lisa noted, we, we just had a leadership team meeting today and that was a topic of conversation. You know, what do these weeks need to look like? What do we need to balance? What can we infuse in that time with our kids that would be engaging knowing that you're right, it's going to be a challenge because it's later than it has been. Um, I do think we have a lot of agency and control over what that balance looks like and how we engage kids. Um, and so as Lisa noted, I think we're all looking at it as an opportunity because we do get these extra days with kids that we don't normally have an opportunity to, to have with them. And so it is going to be important that we're thoughtful and purposeful and strategic about the way in which that time is laid out. Um, and so that's what we are, are focusing our energy on at the leadership team level. Thank you, John Helfant. Hi, John Helfant, a uh, parent of three children at RUHS and RTCC. I just want to be clear on the facts first. So first, a question that the Chick-fil-A fundraiser was canceled by the superintendent. I strongly recommended to the coach to choose a different vendor for the, the fundraising. So you can call it. Yes, I, I put pressure on him to do that. Um, but he did agree to do that, which I thought was very gracious of him. 
Okay, so I guess my comment is that I, I think the school probably shouldn't get involved in canceling fundraisers unless, and I think there are some situations where the, the fundraiser is so egregious that, that adults should step in um, and, and shut it down. I don't think Chick-fil-A is one of those situations, and I think it we lost a really good teaching moment for kids. And that teaching moment is the fact that the world is made up of a lot of different uh, mores, um, a lot of different ways of doing things, uh, a lot of different beliefs. And we could have taught them that in America, capitalism, economics uh, are things that kind of run our country. And if they were allowed to have the Chick-fil-A fundraiser and you know, people that, that don't believe in that company didn't come and they didn't raise a lot of money, they would have learned a, a lesson in economics that you have to basically provide a product that people want. And if it was successful, then they would have learned that it, you know, it's something that can make them money. Um, so I think we really just lost a good teaching moment there. And, and I think we're kind of sheltering our kids some, we got to send them out to the world and the world is full of a lot of different dangers, pitfalls, you know, good things, bad things. And I think we kind of did some sheltering here with canceling the fundraiser. Um, and they need to learn how to live in the world that they're about to enter on their own. And I think when we cancel fundraisers, we, we're we kind of telling them, we're going to make those decisions for you. And they don't get to learn. Um, so that's all I do. Oh, Lisa, I think you're muted. Great. Um, thank you, John, for your perspective. Um, Lori Sargent, you're unmuted. I don't know if that was because you wanted to share or... Um, yes, this is her husband, Mike, and I do want to share, please. Okay. This is Mike Sargent and my wife, Lori. Um, we, were, we were both born here at Gifford Hospital. We both graduated from uh, Randolph Union High School in 79. Our son graduated in 99. Our daughter graduated in 2004. <clears throat> Through, uh, my son played Little League, played all the high school ball. He played uh, Legion Baseball. He played five years of Legion Baseball. And I'm really having a hard time with this Chick-fil-A thing, because my son and our family are proud owners. My son owns a Chick-fil-A franchise. And I'm really disappointed to think that our own town will not accept our son's Chick-fil-A franchise or any other Chick-fil-A franchise to sponsor for to fundraisers for kids. I just can't, it just floors me. I know that there was issues in their beliefs. You know, their beliefs is in same-sex marriage. Well, there's there's at least two Chick-fil-A franchise in New England that are owned and operated by same-sex marriage people. So it, I don't see how you can hold that against them. It's no different than Black Lives Matter flags. We all have to do our changes. We have to forgive and we have to move on. We can't just let something like that go, like you know the Boston thing that happened back in 2012. It's just wrong that we hold that against our society today. Thank you. Thank you. I said, I'm, I'm happy to respond on Chick-fil-A, but nobody's really asked me a direct question about it. So I also want to respect the comments that folks have made. But if folks do have direct questions, I'm happy to answer anything that, that folks have. Yeah. If there are questions or, you know, clo closing thoughts on um, volunteers, 
volunteerism and opportunities at school, I'd appreciate it. And Hannah Arias, I see that you have raised your hand. Thank you. I have, thank you. I, I just have a response um, to to a, a phrase used, and that phrase was move on. And, and I think it's important to note that it is present. Homophobia and transphobia is present, and it is present at Randolph Union High School. It is uh, damaging. It is currently damaging. So um, the thought that we need to move on from something like, like that happened two decades ago it is, um, I, that, that triggered me. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Hannah. Um, David Amadon, you have a raised hand. David? Hi, I'm sorry about that. Can you hear me? Am I on? Yes, okay. Um, <clears throat> the talk about the kids not liking the school, I mean, I've heard that a lot. You know, I was there 10 years ago. I've had nieces and nephews that have gone through that school, uh, the last one graduating last year, and I've got kids in that school. And my son comes home expressing real deep anger that I don't remember feeling when I was 14 at the homophobia and transphobia he hears in the school from kids that he likes to think are his friends and how he doesn't know how to deal with that to the level that he's seeking as a cisgendered straight white male, the most privileged category he can be in, is seeking mental health care because of the hate he's exposed to. And Hannah, I echo that. And Lisa and Katie, I, this is not a criticism of your leadership. The school has gone through some challenges. The world has gone through some challenges. We've had some not great administrators who have done truly bad things. I'm sorry to say that, but, you know, There's a lot of truth that's being said here, and it needs to be respected. I, 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 I want to echo what Hannah said. I really appreciate her saying that. Um, I appreciate the decisions that were made, and I think that the nadir is passed, and we are on an upswing, and I appreciate the work that's being done now. Thank you. Thank you. Dana? Yeah, and I couldn't just sit here and not talk um, to go along with what Hannah said. The racism in our school is out of control and hurtful too. And you can't just walk away or turn off being black or brown or Asian or a BIPOC student at our school. And so you can't walk away from what is, you can't walk away from LGBTQ. You can't walk away from your identity. And we have to start worrying about I'm not saying feel, feeling sorry for or enabling, but we have to start worrying about all students. And um, thank you, Hannah, for raising that awareness. Thank you, Dana. Other thoughts? Um, this hour has gone by pretty quickly from my perspective. Um, John Helfant? I think on this topic, since we got into the nitty gritty on it a little bit, um, I think we need to look, we're all created equal. We're all uh, equal people in the United States of America. Or we're supposed to be. And I think there's people with Christian values. There's people with non-Christian values. And I think the school's job is to teach these children how to respect one another even though you have different values, um, that we treat each other with kindness. And, and even if we discuss, you know, maybe we need some discussions on these issues where kids actually get together, um, Christian kids, uh, kids that have differing beliefs, uh, kids that may have, I don't know, maybe some kids don't want to talk about their homosexuality, uh, or their, their, um, any other gender issues that they may have, um, gender identities that they may have. And kids need to learn to negotiate these. They got to go out into the world and live 
among a hugely diverse population. Um, and they got to learn how to talk to one another. And if kids are coming home angry from, from one side or the other, I mean, Christian kids can come home and feel like certain things are being shoved down their throat. And, and that creates them to be upset as well. So somewhere in here, we're missing the boat that we're not getting these kids to communicate with one another and treat each other with respect. Thank you. Nathan Wright. One thing I just want to add, and I think David White and, and Jeremy and some of the older alumni can attest that Roger Ennis used to be a teacher, our RUHF, and he was probably my favorite teacher. And uh, one of the classes he taught was humanities, which talked about, you know, basically, you know, respecting one another, how to debate, um, how to walk a mile in another person's shoes and really teach that and, and really open up and, you know, student thinking. And it probably was one of the most effective classes for me personally that Roger taught on how to cope outside of school and how to deal with different personalities and different types of people and how to, even though you disagree, how to respect them. Um, you know, so as far as an academic standpoint, you know, maybe, I don't know if you guys offer classes like that, but, you know, having it in a controlled environment like a classroom, um, being able to discuss it, not so much a committee, but a class that people can take. Um, but I think the other thing that, you know, should be brought back, if, if you don't have it, is uh, Mrs. Hutchison used to teach on your own, where you learn the basic necessities of what interest rates are and taxes and the basic life stuff. Um, but, you know, back to Mr. Ennis, just having those kind of classes, he had a few others that just talked about human personalities and, and how to um, deal and respect one another uh, is maybe something that we need to look at, bringing back in for students to access. Thank you, Nathan. Um, I was fortunate to get to teach with Roger Ennis at the beginning of my career, and I always really appreciated his perspective on things. Um, I was going to speak to some of what you said about um, teaching, about how to respectfully have conversation, but I noticed that social studies English teacher Tev Kelman raised his hand, so I'm hopeful that he'll address, um, address a little bit of that. Yeah, I'll, I'll go because I'm here with Ozzy and he's giving me a moment of silence. So if I have to uh, pass it to you in a hurry, at least I will. But yeah, I wasn't going to speak tonight. But when I heard Roger's name, I, I thought I had to because Roger was also my mentor in my first couple of years here. And I, Nathan, I hear that from time to time for folks around town. Uh, I never really got to see him teach, but I, from everything I hear, he's an amazing teacher. And I like to flatter myself that I've tried to follow in his footsteps as far as what, what you're talking about. I'm certainly not the only one. So I think what, what I wanted to say to that is I agree with you 100%. Um, I think that the, the piece that we have to think about as humanities teachers or just people who work with young people and, and are trying to navigate these discussions is how you balance the opportunity for growth with people's safety and how you do that when everybody's opportunity for growth and everybody's potential, the things that might potentially make them feel unsafe um, are so different, you know, and we have incomplete information. Um, I think one of the ground rules I try to follow around debate is that we're not going to debate anybody's identity. You know what I mean? Um, like anybody's right to exist or be seen as, as good. And I think like that, that applies very much to LGBTQ plus people. And I think we got to be honest with ourselves that LGBTQ plus people experience some, some very specific and unique and dangerous um, threats in our society. And as, as people have spoken to that, that, you know, I'm ashamed to say is very, very much true at our school, um, despite a lot of effort on, on oh, behalf God. of a lot of folks um, with a lot of skill and best intentions, but it, it's a real thing, you know, and it's, and there are hundreds of years of history behind that. Um, but I would apply the same principle to, you know, a student, you know, debating whether Christianity is okay. You know, like I, I think if, 
or, or rather whether somebody being a Christian makes them a bad person. As soon as we cross into that line where somebody's humanity is being debated, in my opinion, it's time to shut it down because there's no room for growth for those people in that situation. I don't know if that makes sense, right? Once you're, once you're in a defensive posture and feel like folks are, you know, like you're not welcome because because of who you are in a community that that's not a those aren't conditions that we can teach in so i just want to like shed that light at least into my thought process and maybe there's others um that yeah we are making judgment calls all the time um i i don't know i like i hope i've never heard from a student that they I, I, i'll be honest I've, I've heard once or twice like in the heat of a moment that uh kids felt like maybe i wasn't playing but i Sorry, Ozzy just muted me. What I've been hearing is, you know, mostly the kids do feel safe and do feel like there's a chance to debate ideas. And sometimes kids come into a class expecting to be shouted down or to be made to feel unsafe. Um, I, I don't think that kids are leaving classes at RU feeling that way. And to the extent that they are, I, I agree with you that that's a problem. So I just I just wanted to share that um, and pass it back to Lisa. Thank you, Tev. Um, one of the things that we do starting in seventh grade is prepare students for um, Socratic seminars. And those are opportunities for kids to um, use evidence to have conversations with one another. Um, some of the kids love the evidence collecting part and the writing is really important for them. And some of them really appreciate the opportunity to have a conversation. Um, but those are things that we do, um, whether it's a social studies English partnership like the Roger Ennis humanities model was, or at the eighth grade level, it's a social studies science um, pairing where kids are collecting evidence from both classes in order to have those conversations. So we, we work hard to create those opportunities, um, but after listening to everyone this evening, it feels as if um, that work still is really important and relevant, and we need to focus on it perhaps just a little bit more. Um, I don't know if there's anyone else who would like to share at this point in time. If you have specific questions or concerns, you can reach out to Katie or I directly, and we would love to meet with you or have a conversation. I really appreciate the people who turned out this evening. This has been our most well-attended forum of the year, and I have four pages of notes from this meeting. I really appreciate everyone making the time to come out and um, share your thoughts with us. So I'll hang out in the grid um, if anyone wants to follow up, or please feel free to send an email. Thank you for your time. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Matt? Hey, guys. I'm, I'm sitting on an airplane in the, in the sky, so I hope you can hear me OK. Um, one of the things is I sent uh, uh, some information back in November about the program called Dads of Great Students. And at the time, I was supposed to get a response back at, at some considerations and thoughts. And I know this community piece is a part of that. But uh, I, I've been in and out on the calls. I apologize just just my travel. Um, but it seems to me like the teachers are working their butts off. You guys are working your butts off. There's all this stuff happening, these parental concerns and safety and, and some of the stuff going on in the school. You know, again, I offer out there to, to you know that we can we can help to coordinate and bring folks together, just to be there in the hallways, be there when the kids get to school, sit there during lunch or cafeteria time, just to just to listen to the kids and, and talk to the kids and and uh, be a resource that teachers can have a little breather. So, I just wanted to bring that up again because um, you know, and again, I know you guys have been swamped with a million things, yep. and organizing this is something I'm willing to willing to help with or get folks to. Thank you for that, Matt. Um, I did. We did read that when we received it, and we created a survey to see how many parents felt like they had the capacity to volunteer. I think um, there were only two responses to that, 
So it felt like maybe the community was too tapped out to really launch something um, well. But I, I think that is a program that showed a lot of promise and really was the catalyst for continuing to focus on volunteerism and how we can include the community more in terms of supporting the school and supporting our students. So I really appreciate your focus on that. I don't know if my screen just froze. No, okay. No, I, I appreciate the comment back. I guess, you know, sometimes surveys are buried in emails and folks don't get through them all. Yeah. Um, I'm willing to spread the word to the list of people who are willing to raise their hand and really take action and submit a list to you all of those folks for evaluation, background checks, whatever. And then if we can get the community interested, and obviously I said dads, but it could be moms too, right, or, or folks, and, and get that list together. And then we could really put a plan together in collaboration with you all about uh, how that may work. So uh, I'm willing to do whatever needed. Okay, thank you for that, Matt. I appreciate it. All right. Hello, we're just wrapping up. Um, if you have a question, um, Burstein family, we're here. Right. I feel like I'm going to go ahead and end the call. Um, thank you. Thank you all. Have a wonderful night.